Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So welcome to your third session of the Opioid Use in Primary Care Conference today. This session is titled Considerations for Youth and Adolescent in OUD Management, and we have Dr. James Wang presenting. So before I introduce Dr. Wang, I just wanted to mention that we encourage your questions in the chat throughout the presentation, and we'll save all the questions to be addressed at the very end. So to introduce Dr. James Wang, um, Dr. Wang is a pediatrician specializing in adolescent medicine and addiction medicine. He's also a clinical assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. He provides substance use care to adolescents and young adults at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver and at the Foundry Youth Health Center in North Vancouver. He practices a strengths-based and holistic approach to caring for complex youth struggling with physical health, mental health, and substance use challenges. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Dr. Wang. All right, thank you very much, Megan. Um, I'm very happy to be here to chat about adolescent opioid use. Um, and there's um, a lot that can be said about this topic and about adolescent substance use in general. Um, but um, I've condensed what I thought were some key points into this presentation. Um, here are some of my affiliations, which uh, Megan already went through. Um, and just to start, I want to give a land acknowledgement to where I am situated today um, on the unceded ancestral territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam peoples, um, also known as uh, Vancouver. I don't have any financial conflicts of interest to declare. Um, and today I wanted to really introduce the idea of using a developmental lens for adolescent opioid use specifically, and also thinking about this multidisciplinary model of how we care for uh, youth with substance use issues and opioid use issues. Um, and because uh, a lot of the audience members here are prescribers, I have some um, uh, personal practices and also um, evidence-based practices uh, at the end on medications. Uh, to start, um, when we talk about adolescence in uh, medicine, uh, there's often a, a, peer, a sense of hesitation or apprehension. Um, but adolescence is a time of great change and inspiration. A lot of our um, biggest ideas and uh, biggest accomplishments in humanity came from adolescence. And here's just a number of them that I uh, uh, put together here. Uh, so in sports, in music, in um, activism, and really reminding us of our moral compass, uh, because that is something that's very, very clear um, in this period of adolescence. Um, so there's a lot we can learn from them, uh, not just about them learning from us. Um, and they are very, very amazing uh, to work with. There's different definitions of these terms, the term adolescent and youth get used interchangeably. Um, and there really isn't a clear boundary for when adolescence starts and ends. Um, uh, one definition would be adolescence starts at the onset of physical puberty, which can be um, as young as eight, um, but typically we think about 10 or 11, and ends with either the age of majority uh, in your jurisdiction or with uh, the finishing of um, frontal lobe development, uh, which is in the mid-20s. Um, and the definition of youth sometimes will start in the mid-teens and go until the mid-20s. But again, depending on where you are in the context of your patients, um, the edges might be a bit different. Uh, I will use these terms somewhat interchangeably here. Um, and when they aren't interchangeable, I will uh, point it out. Um, I did mention uh, brain development. This is an obligatory slide whenever we talk about adolescent development. Um, it's from uh, uh, imaging studies on how the parts of the brain mature over time. Um, and there are adolescent developmental stages as well. We think about young children, developmental stages in pediatrics all the time, but adolescents also have really important things they need to do. So learning how to think from more concrete to more abstract, um, being able to, for example, compromise rather than thinking of things as either all or nothing. Um, their from their family relationships, they're separating uh, from their family at the beginning of adolescence and then becoming more independent. So their frame of reference changes from being not part of the family and then to being 
themselves. Um, body image is also another uh, very important part of adolescence as our social relationships um, starting from being very peer conforming and then eventually as you get older being more selective about who you hang out with and who are the people you identify with um, and as an ongoing process through adulthood the, the exploration and refinement of your own self-identity. Um, I have some rough age ranges in the slide here um, from early adolescents around 10 to 14 ish. And again, every individual is going to be different. Middle adolescents, uh, 13 to 17 ish. Uh, late adolescents from about 16 to 21. And young adults from around 19 to 25. And again, some uh, youth will uh, be on the earlier end of the spectrum, some will be on the later end of the, the spectrum. And uh, that is variable. And there's no great test. Um, in terms of like a, a blood test that we can do. It's from uh, judgment. Um, team brains are still developing. They love new things. It's really important for them to explore and gain new experiences and to develop that independence to try things and make mistakes and, um, and try again. Uh, there is this concept of risk, um, but also the, the concept of the time horizon, how far in the future um, is part of their kind of immediate lens. And that gets further and further as you get older. Um, and uh, this is relevant when we think about substance use counseling, for example, teens might not be as concerned of uh, lung cancer, you know, uh, 30, 40 years down the road, um, but they might be more uh, a more effective counseling strategy might be things that are more immediate um, and uh, teen brains are very flexible they're very malleable a lot of diagnoses we don't give in adolescence um, especially in the uh, in some of the mental health domains because we know that they're plastic they still grow um, i often say that every single um, teenager uh, has some of those traits that we might associate with, for example, uh, borderline uh, narcissistic, uh, a little bit antisocial, and that um, is a normal part of adolescent development. What is not normal is when some of those uh, characteristics, uh, characteristics maintain through adulthood and become uh, functionally impairing. Um, when we think about substance use in teens, it is something that's really, really common. A lot of teens use substances for various reasons, and most of the time it isn't problematic. Uh, the majority of teens uh, use substances to have fun, to experiment, uh, to fit in, to be part of um, a peer group or peer activity. And there's a significant proportion that's growing of teens who are using it for stress to manage their mood, to manage their anxiety, their physical pain, and more teens who are identifying uh, with having an addiction. For opioids in particular, um, we uh, these are data from a population study in BC, the Adolescent Health Survey, which has um, a sample size of about 35,000 teenagers from grades 7 to 12. It's a representative sample of what's happening in the province. Um, and we see that about 1% or so of um, high school students uh, report using heroin, fentanyl, or other opioids, and about 4% might be using prescription pills without a doctor's consent other than benzodiazepines. And the majority of these are going to be uh, opioids. Um, so painkillers are the uh, a bigger part of this group. Um, and this is in comparison to some of the other substances that teens might try, such as alcohol, cannabis, and, and tobacco, which are still uh, the uh, three of the top uh, most common substances that teens use. We know that substance use starts really early. And the earlier it starts, the higher risk someone is for having problematic substance use. Um, there's this quote from uh, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network in the US that says that nine out of 10 people with substance use problems started by age 18. And this is something that um, when I uh, did my training in the adult world, uh, I would talk to um, patients about how their opioid use started. Uh, how their problematic substance use started. And so many times we, are, we end up talking about their adolescent years or about their childhood. Um, and that's something that, um, uh, th that's part of the reason why I work with youth, um, knowing that perhaps intervening at this critical time period, there could be a shift uh, that has lasting impacts for their trajectory. In the past year, um, there have been a, a lot of uh, very tragic cases in the news, uh, including some that have recently uh, been published that 
uh, I didn't include in this presentation. Um, here are a few from BC, which unfortunately is leading uh, the way in uh, toxic drug uh, uh, deaths in teens. Um, and this has made the news from uh, our coroner's report that in 2023, looking back at the previous five years, the rate of uh, teenage deaths due to the toxic drug crisis has become the number one reason for teen deaths, exceeding suicide, which for many years was um, the number one uh, cause of accidental death. Um, here are some statistics to uh, back up those figures uh, that uh, we see this rise um, here in BC. And this is also a, a situation we see nationwide. Uh, the most recent figures from Canada are about 46% of accidental uh, deaths um, under 19 are due to uh, toxic drugs. Um, so that's a, a very high number and uh, there's no sign that it's uh, leveling off at any point. Um, and when we look at what substances are causing deaths, um, fentanyl and analogs like carfentanyl by far, by far are the number one cause of deaths, or, or, or it's, it's detected, I should say, it's detected in the system of those who have died under 19. Uh, this is in comparison to other substances which are below the one third mark. Um, so this is, uh, opioids are uh, a really, really big issue. Um, it's something that is taking the lives of, um, of young people and it will continue to do so uh, unless we um, intervene. One thing that we often talk about when working with uh, children and youth is that adolescents are not small adults um, and their substance use patterns are different. And it's not always easy to figure out when an adolescent has a problematic opioid use problem uh, because they might not look like they have a problem. We often um, have a pattern recognition way of approaching clinical medicine and adolescents don't often fit into that clinical picture that we might have. Um, their use patterns are not well established. We know that teens can be very sporadic or opportunistic in their use. They tend to like using uh, pills more so than um, uh, substances like inhaled fentanyl or inhaled methamphetamine. Uh, the pill form is often much more common uh, they tend to mix multiple substances at the same time or within the same time period or alternate between multiple substances, sometimes because of what is available, sometimes they're using them interchangeably um, because they haven't developed necessarily that same tolerance or that same preference for one substance. And because with sporadic use or even uh, semi-frequent use, um, you don't build up as much of that tolerance, a lot of teens might not have very significant withdrawal symptoms. Uh, this is something we see, uh, we consider in alcohol use disorder, for example, where we don't really um, worry too much about withdrawal seizures or delirium tremens in adolescents because of this same idea. It takes time for some of those uh, really severe withdrawal symptoms to um, uh, develop. And we know that teens can have very serious problems without meeting the diagnostic criteria for opioid use disorder. Um, we're seeing the deaths, we're seeing these teens in the morgue, and we would really, really hope to catch them uh, far earlier. Um, neurodevelopmentally, we think about where their brains are and where they're going uh, and their potential in the next decade. Um, and our general um, counseling is that there is no safe level of substance use for adolescents. At the same time, uh, that doesn't mean we take an abstinence-based uh, approach. It's very much along this harm reduction spectrum. Uh, another really important point is the idea of prevention and um, uh, targeting uh, adolescents and pre-adolescents early, even in elementary school, to start talking about the concept of drugs, overdose, safety, harm reduction, similar to how uh, we have a gradated way of education for sexual health. Um, the way to address adolescent uh, opioid use uh, specifically is to use a multidisciplinary intervention or a multimodal intervention. Um, we do this in adult addictions. However, in teens, it is even more important that we bring in a, a, a team around them. Uh, it's not something that one person or one practitioner can do to the best of their ability. Um, it, require, it does require really a village to help um, reverse some of these um, trends. Uh, here are six areas that are identified from the United Nations Office on 
um, uh, drug and crime, uh, mental health services, parenting skills training, family therapy, community and school screening, brief interventions in the clinical encounter, and referral to um, uh, tertiary uh, health services. Um, one of the uh, important things to think about for teenagers is that um, there often is an underlying psychiatric disorder or concurrent disorder, we might call it a dual diagnosis. Uh, we have statistics that show that up to about 75% or three in four adolescents with a substance use disorder also have an underlying psychiatric disorder. So um, if uh, uh, you see some uh, a, a teenager or um, a young adult with uh, a substance use disorder, opioid use disorder, make sure to also screen for those underlying drivers, um, which should be treated at the same time as the substance use disorder. In this graph here, this is a, from a meta-analysis of uh, the ages when these disorders tend to occur. And you can see the peak occurrence of certain disorders, like eating disorders, which is um, another very uh, high mortality um, psychiatric disorder. Um, that occurs in the kind of middle adolescence around 15. Um, anxiety, uh, you know, has two peaks, one in childhood and one in middle adolescence, but it really occurs um, uh, throughout uh, adolescence. And then with substance use disorders, um, the peak is around that uh, late adolescent time. However, uh, it's, it's uh, broad and youth can absolutely have substance use disorders earlier. Um, and in my practice, I, um, I have definitely have youth who have had problematic opiate use as young as 12. Um, another consideration that might be different from adult addictions is how to support parents and caregivers. And again, in adult addictions, this does happen. However, when we're talking about youth substance use and youth opiate use, uh, this is a, a focus that really needs to be highlighted. Um, on the left there, I have a chart of ad uh, adverse childhood experiences. Um, this is uh, becoming more well known in uh, both uh, practice, but also in uh, the general public. Um, the idea that uh, these uh, early childhood um, experiences can have long lasting, permanent and life limiting effects on one's health. Uh, so that includes physical, emotional, sexual abuse, physical, emotional neglect, uh, mental illness, um, intimate partner violence in the home, substance use in the home, divorce in the home, uh, or an incarcerated relative. From the many uh, uh, research articles that have been published about um, the risk factors for adolescent substance use, because this is uh, an area of interest for researchers and for policymakers, some of the consistently high risk factors for opioid use are poverty, housing instability, and parent substance use. And these should really guide how we address um, the risk factors for youth when we see them in our practice. So targeted interventions could include financial and housing security. And this is something that I um, often say, I wish I could prescribe housing, or I wish I could prescribe financial security or food security. But the reality is uh, that um, is uh, above and beyond um, my uh, capabilities as uh, a physician. Um, another very important intervention is parent support or caregiver support. This includes skills training, so parenting skills training. Um, nobody uh, teaches you how to become a parent or how to uh, have the, uh, uh, you know, evidence-based skills on parenting. Um, kids don't come with a manual on uh, how to parent them. So uh, depending on your upbringing or your background, you may come with different uh, sets of norms or uh, perceived norms on what is uh, uh, appropriate parenting skills or helpful parenting skills. MDFT is multi-dimensional family therapy. Um, and this is um, a, a modality that has been shown in the literature to help with very high risk youth, um, especially those who are involved in the justice system. And this is the idea of healing uh, those family connections, healing those attachments rather than letting the cycle of detachment and trauma continue. Um, it really is an intergenerational project um, and uh, it's difficult to um, completely change uh, uh, this intergenerational cycle in one intervention um, or even in a short-term intervention. Um, uh, another uh, modality that I 
particularly like is emotion focused family therapy EFFT and this teaches um, parents and caregivers and also clinicians how to communicate and de-escalate um, in situations where there's uh, parent-child conflict for example and peer, uh, peer support for parents I have found very helpful. Parents often feel alone in uh, dealing with what's going on or feeling confused, especially when in reality there aren't a whole lot of programs uh, or uh, evidence-based interventions that we can offer them. Um, a lot of this research is still emerging. And lastly, if the parent struggles with their own substance use disorder or problematic substance use, uh, I am often providing counseling to them that uh, addressing that will also help their child. Um, when we think about how to work with youth, um, we have this acronym of SHADES or HEADS, uh, which um, some of you may be familiar with from um, uh, uh, medical education. Uh, and SHADES stands for Strengths, School, Home, Activities, Drugs, Emotions, slash Mental Health, and Sexual Health. And there's slight variations that you can use for this acronym. But the principles underlying how we communicate with youth, how we work with youth, um, with substance use disorders or with whatever they're coming to us with, is that we are youth-centered. That we see youth as a holistic person, that they are not defined by their diagnoses. They have dreams and aspirations, they have goals they like to meet, they have functions that they need to do. Um, and they have their own perspective about what are their barriers. And we can never 100% know everything about what their experience is like. So we need to be humble about that and really um, bring the lens back to them. Um, I always advocate for the strength-based approach, which is thinking about youth as uh, from a positive lens. Um, another way of thinking about it is unconditional positive regard. What are they good at? What are they proud of? Uh, what do their friends and family like about them? And sometimes youth have never been asked these questions before, and they might feel very sheepish or embarrassed to talk about things, or they might not be able to come up with anything when I ask them, what are you good at? They said, I don't know, I'm not good at anything. Um, so it's important for, for clinicians to take that lens of this is a youth with incredible potential, and how can we help them meet it, rather than this is a problematic youth with a lot of problems and deficits. Um, it's important to be non-judgmental, meeting youth where they're at in their substance use, what beliefs and values are important to them. And that may be different from our values, and that's OK. Um, our job is to help them uh, live their best life and meet their uh, potential, uh, not to cast our judgment on them. And I know uh, many folks in this uh, presentation will, uh, in the audience, will uh, also align with this value as well. Uh, another area I wanted to point out, and this is from my, my own research, is that um, experiences with healthcare are very important. Um, many Adolescents, especially who are coming from uh, marginalized communities, indigenous communities, have had negative health experiences in the past. It's really important early on to set up an expectation that um, when you come for help, when you seek help, that someone will be there to receive you, that you're not going to be judged. Um, and the longer we wait to give someone a positive healthcare experience, the harder it is um, going to be to change their perspective about what we can do. And the last one is about confidentiality, which I'll also touch about uh, touch on at the very end. Um, it's important to think about um, adolescents and who is around them, who is part of the village, who is part of their care team. So uh, it could be a parent or caregiver. Sometimes a parent or caregiver is not the most appropriate person in their lives. There's um, there should be some other adults in their lives, and if there aren't, uh, uh, part of your goal could be to bring in supports. Um, so are there other relatives? Are there social workers? Are there youth workers? counselors, doctors, and so on. Um, these are, uh, and teachers, uh, these are really important people who um, adolescents and, and young adults need in their lives to grow um, and to really feel like they have a safe space to grow. One thing I always ask adolescents is if their parent or caregiver calls, because this happens uh, more often than you might expect uh, to request information or to get an update, um, what would they be comfortable sharing and what would they like to keep private? Uh, you'll find that many adolescents will perceive confidentiality not as a all or nothing issue. There are things that they are comfortable sharing with different people, and this includes social workers, um, and some things are not. So it's important to ask, and this also allows you to have that conversation of saying, well, sometimes it's helpful to bring in the parent or caregiver and to try to heal that, that relationship to um, have a more enduring 
uh, intervention. Um, these interventions are going to be familiar to many folks who work in uh, addictions and working with um, uh, patients with opiate use disorder. Um, motivational interviewing is huge. Um, it is an evidence-based uh, 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 counseling modality, along with the parent skills training, along with multidimensional family therapy for um, adolescent substance use and opiate use. Um, this is the book that um, I think is uh, foundational. Um, this is the fourth edition that just came out recently. Um, it is fantastic. It's uh, easy read. It's very skills-based um, and has just fabulous pearls in there. Uh, so I highly recommend it, the Mil uh, Miller and Rolnick book. Um, we think about other strategies we might use with motivational interviewing and motivational interviewing really about reflecting the, the individual's own motivations. And for teens, it's the same thing. It's about helping them highlight or clarify their motivations rather than coming in from that paternalistic way of saying, well, I'm going to tell you what to do. At the same time, we also need to recognize that um, there are some things that teens are better at making judgments of and things that they might not. Um, for example, you might not trust a 12-year-old uh, to make their own dinner for a week, um, but you might trust an 18-year-old to do that. Or you might not trust um, a 15-year-old to drive a car, but uh, you might trust a 23-year-old. So uh, there's so much happening in these um, uh, 12 to 15 years that um, it really depends which individual you're talking about and where they are along that developmental spectrum for how you approach your motivational counseling. Um, uh, harm reduction is another area that I find very important in um, substance use in general, but especially opioid use in adolescents. Uh, many adolescents, when they start using uh, opioids, they may not know um, the difference between opioids and benzodiazepines, for example. They may not know that um, what they're using is similar to fentanyl or is in the same class. They may not know that uh, what's labeled on the pill is not actually what the pill is, and they might trust that label implicitly. So these are areas that um, it's, uh, you can use to create that, uh, uh, develop that discrepancy as an MI um, by showing them harm reduction uh, uh, strategies such as drug checking. I find teens love this one. They, they love to know what their uh, substances are. You can do this either through um, a, a drug checking service in your local area, or I also use the uh, urine drug screen sometimes if they had used you know, within the past two or three days. I would say, let's see what's in your system. It wouldn't have helped what happened, but for your own knowledge, is, uh, is this thing that you think is um, oxycodone, for example, uh, is it actually what it is? Can you trust your friend or your dealer? Um, uh, using test strips is another important thing, uh, as is uh, teaching about uh, naloxone. Um, I find that adolescents are incredibly kind and compassionate. Um, I, uh, they all want to learn how to help their friends who are also using opioids. They want to learn, uh, they want to learn how to help strangers, and they are um, uh, just incredibly uh, um, uh, hopeful and optimistic about the future in that way, um, and I think we should support them in that. There's a push in BC to have um, mandatory uh, naloxone and CPR training in high schools um, after the recent deaths. Um, okay, I'm going to shift uh, gears now to uh, medications. Um, so if you're not a prescriber, um, this may not be as relevant to you. When we think about evidence-based medications for adolescent opioid use, so this is uh, in under 18 or 19 years old, um, so not the young adults, uh, we only have a couple of different options, and not all of them are available in Canada. So um, buprenorphine uh, depot injections is a long-acting buprenorphine. Uh, there's uh, buprenorphine naloxone sublingual tablets and methadone. And those are kind of our, that's it. That's our evidence-based um, options for opioid use disorder in Canada that's available. In the US, they have naltrexone depot injections, which are month-long um, uh, injections uh, with an opioid antagonist, um, but we don't have that in Canada. However, for um, youth who use opioids sporadically or might pick them up at parties or use them interchangeably with benzodiazepines, for example, um, I might, um, if they also have alcohol use disorder, I am a big proponent of putting them on naltrexone because that can be very protective and you just have to be clear about what that might do to the opioid use and um, painkillers, for example, if they need surgery. 
Here are some sample um, protocols that um, I use in my practice. And again, this needs to be tailored to your individual patient and it's not appropriate for every single one. It's not a cookie cutter practice, especially with our um, uh, lack of uh, strong evidence. Um, and you have to use your clinical judgment and have close monitoring for these patients. Uh, but for many of my patients who I'm starting on uh, buprenorphine, my aim is to get them to long-acting buprenorphine because we know that medication adherence in adolescence and young, young adulthood is very, very difficult. And for something with a short half-life, like buprenorphine, naloxone tablets, uh, if you miss a dose, then you're not protected. So the, the long-acting is often where I would like most of the youth to um, end up uh, if they need um, opioid agonist therapy. Uh, so this is one way of doing a standard induction uh, to start on day one with a test dose uh, and then uh, a full dose and then using PRNs as needed if they are having withdrawal. Um, and this is in a situation where you don't expect withdrawal or the youth is um, uh, already in a lot of withdrawal. Um, and then consolidating to your, your therapeutic dose of 12 to 16 milligrams or so. Um, and the... Um, timing of switching to long-acting buprenorphine can be more flexible. The product monograph uh, says to have seven days on a stable buprenorphine dose between 8 to 16 milligrams. Um, however, that came more from what was studied in the research uh, when we did the safety studies. But uh, clinically, if you only have a window of 48 hours to get the long-acting buprenorphine into the youth, um, I uh, would absolutely advocate to use it early as long as they can tolerate that um, uh, you know, minimum eight milligrams a day. If they can tolerate that without becoming too somnolent, uh, they will most likely be able to tolerate the long acting buprenorphine. There's also um, some emerging evidence more from the internal medicine side about starting with long acting buprenorphine and skipping the, the pill induction completely. However, that's still very, very new and not part of standard practice. Um, here is a sample protocol that I might use for a low dose induction. And again, uh, this can be tailored based on what the patient needs, what they're open to, what you can do in your inpatient setting. Um, I wouldn't advocate doing this in an outpatient setting, even with blister packs, unless you're very confident that the, the youth have uh, good monitoring, just because even with blister packs, it can be really hard for youth to manage their own medications. Um, and it's hard for adults to do it. So um, it's even harder for youth, uh, and it's not their fault. Um, so in an inpatient setting, uh, I might use something like this, which is a five-day titration schedule for a youth who um, might be at higher risk of uh, precipitated withdrawal with uh, OAT, or uh, might be at higher risk of um, uh, you know, hesitancy about trying medications, or they're particularly anxious or nervous, and we have the time they're willing to stay in the hospital for this. So uh, I, I use this kind of a, a four times a day schedule. Again, I can modify it. And if for um, uh, in the off, uh, off chance that there is precipitated withdrawal, there are other interventions we can do for that, um, similar to in adults. Um, so this is a schedule I might use. And again, once I get to that um, uh, you know, treatment level dose, that eight to 16 milligrams, um, if you only have a short window, then um, I think the risks and benefits uh, generally favor switching to long-acting buprenorphine uh, rather than waiting for the, um, uh, I guess, uh, arbitrary seven days uh, on a stable dose. But again, use your clinical judgment. Um, this, I hope, uh, gives you some ideas about how to be creative, um, and I'm always happy to talk more about it. Uh, with buprenorphine injections, since I am such a big a proponent of it, um, I've developed some strategies that I use in, in my practice that really help with the one thing that youth are very hesitant about, and uh, which is pain. Um, and this is definitely not something I discount. It is something that uh, is really, really important to address, even if the youth doesn't ask it, um, because it uh, would affect your ability to have an enduring therapy uh, uh, for your maintenance doses. Uh, you want the youth to be comfortable so that they can continue on this treatment for as long as they need. Uh, here are some tips that I use for buprenorphine injection pain management. Um, removing the medication from the refrigerator at least an hour prior. If you're doing it shorter, then maybe holding it in your hand to warm it up faster. 
um, it does have less pain if it's at room temperature. Um, I almost always uh, give some analgesics beforehand. So acetaminophen, ibuprofen are great options. Um, just a reminder that for um, smaller teens to use weight-based dosing, um, uh, 15 milligrams per kilo up to 1,000 milligrams for acetaminophen or 10 milligrams per kilo up to 800 milligrams for ibuprofen. Uh, and if needed, um, and I would say that's needed a lot of the time, uh, adding an anxiolytic. My preference is to use quetiapine, and many of my um, youth are already on quetiapine, uh, but for other youth, um, lorazepam could be uh, an, an option as well, especially if benzodiazepines are not part of their um, uh, uh, substance use pattern. Um, there, we have also experimented with other methods of providing this um, anxiolytic uh, or uh, using pharmacotherapy at uh, in BC, for example, using things like nitrous oxide. Um, and uh, the major barrier is most likely uh, access to a space and also the, the medication to be able to do it. But when we have a, um, a, a, a collaborating anesthesiologist, it makes it go really, really smoothly, especially for the very young teens or those with developmental delays, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder um, uh, or autism spectrum disorder. Uh, thirdly, I um, would recommend using an ice pack on the injection site for that numbing uh, for about 15 minutes prior. Uh, you can do longer if you needed, um, but uh, don't skip the step because that numbing is really helpful. Some of my colleagues might use um, a topical uh, uh, lidocaine, and uh, I use it too if, I, if it's available, it's, but not all the time. Um, there are some in the community who might use uh, intradermal or uh, subcutaneous lidocaine. Um, for teens, I haven't found that to be particularly effective, mainly because that needle in itself um, also heightens anxiety, and we know that when anxiety is heightened, pain signals are also heightened. Uh, number four, I think, is probably one of the most important pieces on this list, which is distraction. Um, I try my best to have an assistant, a resident, a, a patient's friend or parent there to hold their phone so that they can watch a, a video or watch um, a, a reel uh, or TikTok or whatever it is that they prefer. Um, many youth also come with headphones so they can play music um, or engaging them in conversation, breathing exercises, mindful exercises, depending on what works for them. Um, it's really helpful to have an assistant there so that you are not doing both the injection and also the distraction. But if you have to, um, uh, you can. Um, number five is about injecting as quickly as possible as a consideration. Uh, the, re the general recommendation is to go slow. However, um, I find that having the needle in uh, a teen's um, skin, that can increase anxiety. Um, and just the waiting can really increase their anxiety. So if you push it a bit faster, there's a balance between the risks and benefits of doing that. Um, but in general, I try to um, inject relatively quickly um, without applying too much pressure on the syringe. Uh, and then number six is something that um, uh, we like to do in uh, uh, pediatrics, which is offer a prize or reward. I really hope that this can um, also uh, uh, affect uh, some of the practices in the adult world as well, because who doesn't like prizes? Um, uh, but when you have a youth who comes in, does their injection, uh, and you go out with them for Starbucks, or you give them a Starbucks card, or um, a coffee card, or a um, food card, something like that, um, it makes it much easier for them to come back, much easier for them to adhere to a very anxiety-provoking treatment. Um, so I highly, highly recommend that as well. So these are just the, some, some of my tips I found helpful over um, my experience in uh, using long-term buprenorphine in teens, um, and there might be other um, strategies you have that also work well. Uh, I just put this here to think about um, uh, some pharmacologic or pharmacokinetic considerations for teens. Um, knowing that their physiology isn't quite the same as adults, it's also not the same as young children. Their weight can be very variable. Their body composition in terms of water, protein, and body fat are also different. Um, this can affect your volumes of distribution, and for your fat-soluble medications, this affects um, how those work. Um, your CYP450 uh, enzymes can sometimes be faster. So, for example, lorazepam, the metabolism can be faster in teens than in adults. 
um, if they have another disorder like eating disorders, um, which is another area of interest for me, uh, you know, co-occurring eating and substance use disorders, uh, GI absorption could be affected. If um, certain medications can affect their growth spurt, affect their growth plates, uh, for example, phenobarbital. Um, and in general, in pediatrics, we are almost always practicing outside of uh, safety and efficacy studies in our populations. We do a lot of extrapolation. We do a lot of inference because um, uh, there just really aren't a lot of safety studies and it's not always um, ethical to do randomized control studies in these populations. Um, I'm going to spend the next couple minutes just talking about some medical, legal, and ethical considerations. Um, there are, you know, this could be its own separate talk or its own separate conference uh, because th there's just so much that uh, can complicate the, the situation, whether from uh, uh, interaction clinically or from a, a legal perspective, uh, what your duties are as a, as a clinician when we think about teens. Um, one thing that many providers struggle on where to find the balance is how to involve the caregiver. Um, and my general advice is that if the caregiver is workable, to try to involve them in the treatment, maybe not right away, maybe not on the first visit um, if the youth is not comfortable, but to have that in your mind as a um, near future goal if possible and to take it at the youth's pace. And sometimes um, you might be surprised about uh, what the youth uh, might see as uh, initially very scary or anxiety provoking uh, about involving the caregivers and when the reality actually happens of how the involvement might occur, whether there's family therapy or whether it's simply about harm reduction, um, uh, it might give them a different perspective. Uh, confidentiality is another very important aspect when we talk about teens. Um, and this might vary depending on which jurisdiction you're in. Uh, for example, medical records, who has access to them, investigations, who has access to them, um, cons uh, and uh, uh, coming to healthcare, seeking healthcare, who has access to their confidential information. And in some jurisdictions, the caregivers uh, technically can request it. And in other jurisdictions, there are it's more uh, variable. Um, it's also that confidentiality is something that medical legally we need to protect for our patients. Um, and uh, so resisting that for, for some providers, uh, it's important to resist the urge to um, call the family with uh, every single update without running it through the youth. Um, I always talk to the youth before I call families and I say, this is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm not going to say. Um, are you okay with that? What would you like to adjust? Um, you know, I'm, I'm your doctor, I'm not your parents' doctor, and this is your private information, you know, with the caveat about safety. With capacity and consent, uh, this question comes up very often uh, at children's hospitals, um, and it's very uh, clinical decision dependent. You can have capacity for one decision, but not for another decision. You can have capacity for part of one treatment decision, but not for a different part of one treatment decision. Uh, and consent is also variable depending on jurisdiction. Um, so if there is um, any uh, uh, question about this, you know, please do ask your local um, children's hospital or pediatric specialist, adolescent medicine specialist, addiction specialist, if they're comfortable. Um, consult your clinical ethicist if you have access to one. Um, and knowing that, you know, it's not all or nothing. Uh, youth can, can absolutely have capacity for certain decisions, and they might not have capacity for other decisions. Um, another really important consideration is that in adults, we think about capacity as a default, that someone has capacity unless they demonstrate otherwise. Uh, when we are talking about minors, this is not um, presumed. Uh, and again, depending on your site of practice and your institutional culture, uh, where you start on that capacity spectrum uh, could be different. Uh, but there is no expectation that you assume capacity uh, for minors. Uh, similarly with consent, uh, there's consent, there's assent, which is where, um, you know, the mature minor idea that uh, someone who can uh, consent or agree and express uh, their knowledge of risks and benefits of a decision, they can express their consent or assent. Um, and in other jurisdictions, uh, they cannot. So, for example, in Quebec, there is a very clear line of age 14. Um, as a demonstrating uh, as the line for having capacity and not. Um, and uh, the last consideration is uh, child protection. Uh, so this is uh, 
a very um, uh, can be very anxiety provoking for providers as well to think about when do I involve the child protective services? When do I involve CAS? Um, what is the actual protection concern? What are they actually going to do, uh, if anything, or maybe they'll do more than what you expect? Um, we do have a mandated uh, reporting duty in um, uh, most jurisdictions, uh, I think all jurisdictions actually, that if there's a concern of um, abuse or neglect, um, then uh, then we do have a, an obligation to do that. And how you do this, I al I'm always open about it. I, I try not to surprise um, patients and families with a child protection report. Uh, I'm saying this is the reason why I have to do it. I'm legally mandated to do so. This is um, hopefully going to help you uh, be able to uh, be healthier and to uh, potentially access more supports. Um, uh, and sometimes it's not clear. If that's the case, and you have access to a social worker, um, talk it over with them. Um, sometimes the families uh, might be wanting to protect their child, but they're not able to. And that's also a kind of a gray area as well. So all of these can be um, considerations when we think about uh, working with teens. It can get complex and not every situation has all of these complexities. Um, on the right there, I just have a, a little uh, graph that uh, was shared by one of our ethicists about, you know, when, when we are thinking about these ethical considerations, oftentimes it's because there are different values that are coming into conflict with each other, whether it's autonomy or desire to not cause harm, they come into conflict with, with each other. So when we acknowledge that, we know that, you know, there's no perfect solution. There's often multiple solutions that could work. So asking yourself if the options are effective, whether they don't cause more harm, they're non-discriminatory, are they fair, and are they the least intrusive way of achieving what you want to achieve? Um, and to sometimes take a, a deep breath and, and step back and to really think about this in this more structured way can help um, filter through uh, some of our own uh, counter transference as well. So just to summarize here, the learning objectives again, uh, this is a fast and furious overview of uh, working with adolescents with opioid use and substance use in general. Uh, the two highlighted points are that developmental lens, really thinking about uh, um, adolescents, young adults along that spectrum of development. A 12 year old is not the same as a 24 year old um, and where they are and how that might affect your understanding of their um, their judgment, their capacity, um, their thought process, their motivations. And secondly, to really bring in that multimodal, multidisciplinary approach for adolescent OPUs care, bringing your team members. It's, this is not a, a one person um, team, uh, if, if you can help it. Um, you really do need to have a village around these uh, high risk and often marginalized um, youth. Um, so make sure to do that. Caregivers can be very, very helpful. Um, healing that attachment is something that um, has been shown in the literature to be helpful for adolescent uh, substance use disorders. Um, and lastly, some pharmacotherapy tips and the long acting buprenorphine pain management tips that I had there, um, which I hope will be helpful in your practice. Um, and these are, um, uh, this concludes my presentation or the, the structure part of it. So if you have any questions, uh, Megan will, uh, let me know. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Wang. This has been a very informative presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat, and it looks like more are rolling in, which is great. Um, so the first couple came up while you were discussing the buprenorphine injections. And so one of them was, what does the evidence base look like for buprenorphine extended release injection in adolescence? Yeah, this is a very good question. So when we think about evidence, there's different grades of evidence. Um, you are not going to find a, a randomized control trial uh, for this, uh, at least yet. Um, and the, the product monograph will go down to, I think, age 18. However, in practice in, in BC, we were the first to use buprenorphine long-acting injections in any patients. And the first uh, patient who got long-acting buprenorphine in Canada was actually um, a middle adolescent. I think they were maybe 14 or 15 um, in BC. Uh, so we have experience uh, using long-acting buprenorphine down to age 13 or 14. Um, and that is more of an expert um, uh, consensus or expert um, advice rather than uh, uh, a randomized controlled trial in terms of evidence. So there is evidence from that, that perspective and there's emerging evidence for younger teens. I think I, I see papers 
for age 70, and I know there are papers that are coming uh, for younger teens as well, um, a lot of them from Canada, which is great. Um, yeah, so uh, that is where we are. And just a reminder that when we work with children and, and teens, oftentimes we, we don't have, you know, very, very robust studies and we have to be able to proceed without them. Great, thank you for answering that question. Um, and a related question was, how quickly can you inject it? You said as quickly as possible. You might have addressed this a little bit as, mm -hmm. as your presentation went on, but if you can comment yes. on that, that would be great. Um, in my practice, I've injected it over, I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute. Basically, what, what I do is I put sufficient pressure on the syringe. And with that 300 milligrams, it's a lot harder because it's more fluid. Um, with 100 milligrams, it's a lot easier. Basically, I want to feel like I'm pushing the, uh, the, the fluid through the syringe without the risk of breaking the syringe. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't express a lot of, a ton of force on the syringe, um, but I'm also not watching my clock and trying to stretch out the time. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I can often get it in in 30 seconds. A minute would be on the longer end, but still appropriate. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, uh, so this is from Alyssa, and they said, I haven't followed the situation closely, they're in Ontario, but my understanding is that BC is considering implementing mandatory treatment for youth who overdose. Is this accurate? And what are your thoughts on this kind of intervention? I have not heard that in BC, and I think in the, the current um, uh, uh, cli uh, political climate uh, and clinical climate, I don't think that would be a, a direction that uh, will happen anytime soon, uh, any kind of mandated treatment. Um, it is a, a good question. It's one of our controversial areas in uh, addictions care in general, but especially when it comes to teens, uh, about this um, idea of mandated treatment. And the range of mandata mandated treatment is, is variable. It could be short term, like two days, three days to clear the overdose. It could be um, medium term or short medium term, like a week, like they have in Alberta for secure care. It could be like in the US where they have, they actually have like full mandated treatment policies. Um, we don't have evidence for it working or for it not working uh, in teenagers. Um, most of the studies that have been done on involuntary care came from the adult prison or, or judicial system. Uh, incarceration system, I should say, uh, and um, we really don't know about how it works in, in adolescence. And again, voluntariness is also a range as well. There is completely voluntary and completely involuntary. There's a whole lot of gray in the middle that yeah. that is oftentimes where we lie. Um, and you know, if you if it, if you give a youth um, uh, you know kindness and compassion uh, and a connection, and they're willing to stay in the hospital voluntarily to detox. Um, that is oftentimes a, a positive scenario, uh, but um, yeah, it, it, is a, it is a complex situation. I don't think uh, anyone has a clear answer, but it's a, a hot topic of interest for sure. Definitely. Thanks for your answer to that. Um, and another question that came through, on the prevention side, where do you access drug aware videos, et cetera, for mm -hmm. teens, um, and, and maybe pr parents' primary care providers? So for example, drug testing options or promotions for help? It depends what you're looking at and it depends wh where you are. I, I find there are some general resources from um, uh, the government of Canada that you can search. Um, they're not always the most um, youth friendly in terms of the, the graphics or the layout, uh, but they can. They, there are some that are written for the general public. Uh, that parents might find helpful or primary care providers might find helpful. Um, and your individual location. So CAMH, I know, has a lot of a lot of resources on their website. In BC, we have Kelty Mental Health um, uh, that has uh, information as well. Um, drug testing, again, it's going to be, if you're looking for general information about what is out there, um, one way to look for is kind of general statistics, such as on the CAMH website. Uh, but if you're looking to say, well, you should go here for drug testing, then you really need to know what your local resources are. Um, a lot of the uh, resources are for adults, though, um, which sometimes can be uh, 
appropriate for, for teens and parents, but oftentimes um, some things might not apply to them. Uh, we don't have a ton of um, a ton of resources that's targeted just towards teens, and that's something I would be very interested in developing kind of this like public education campaign. Um, the U.S. has more of them, so the uh, national institutes uh, will have more resources there. But again, some of those might not apply to Canada. They, they have different acronyms there. For example, they don't use the term OAT. Um, and uh, maybe one last thing I can think about for, for resources. Um, there, there is a, a resource, uh, two resources I use um, frequently. Uh, one is, um, oh, let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, it's called drugcocktails.ca. And that one is developed here at BC Children's Hospital uh, from one of our pharmacists. It's about the interactions between um, drugs and alcohol and medications. So for example, if you are using the substance, does it, how does it interact with your medications? Um, this should be used a bit cautiously. I've, I've had it backfire sometimes where youth have said, well, I guess I'll stop my medications then. And I said, oh, okay, well, hold on. Um, so I think uh, it, it can be really helpful information, but then you have to bring it into a clinical context. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's one, one resource. And the other one is get your drugs tested, um, uh, that, which I had on one of my slides. Uh, and that one I find it, it's helpful just to have a, um, a, a conversation with, with youth about contamination because they have an Instagram account, they're active on social media where youth are, and they have actual pictures of what the what the substances look like. And then they'll say, well, this was what it was sold as, this was what it actually was. They also publish um, lists uh, or statistics every month, uh, or some sites publish every month about what's in the community. Um, uh, so I find this very helpful to just say, hey, by the way, you know, that, that Oxy that you bought, here, is this what it kind of looked like? Well, look at this one, you know, this was Oxy, but actually it was just sucrose, um, or actually it was fentanyl. Um, and, and sometimes just creating that discrepancy without saying, therefore you should stop, or therefore you should be, you should change what you're doing. You should say, well, what do you think about that? It, isn't, it, isn't it curious that this is different? And then just see where they go with it. Great, I see that Sharon um, shared a link to in the chat. So thank you for doing that. Um, it sounds like this is an oper potential opportunity to, to develop some learning resources, maybe like co-developing them with youth for youth. Yes, um, we have. Um, we do have a toolkit for primary care providers that we just launched in BC um, and it's available publicly. So that's on our Pathways BC website about uh, for, for primary care providers, um, more targeted towards those who don't do addictions work but um, it, it's definitely a great resource uh, if you're not familiar and working with teens and substance use on how to approach it, what are some of the risk factors to consider. It has that developmental range that uh, goes into that a little bit more. So if you're interested, you can look up the Pathways BC um, Child and Youth Substance Youth Clinical Care Pathway for primary great. care. Okay, we have one more question, and I think we have about two minutes left, so maybe uh, we can go through this one quickly. But growing up in the 80s when war on drugs was the message, what messages do we need to promote along with sexual health, as you yeah. mentioned, to our teens in the school system and at primary care? Okay, this is something that I think is so important because teens and, and children spend much of their lives in school, and that's where they're going to receive a lot of the information and the power of the school and teachers is unparalleled. And if you're a parent, you will know this, that sometimes kids will come home and say, well, my teacher said this, and that is going to be a, a very important thing they fixate on. Uh, so uh, I'm going to use sexual health as a parallel, because when we think about sexual health education, it's not a one-time thing. It's not like, you know, your grade six, grade seven, grade eight health ed class. That's not just sexual health education. It starts from very young, you know, preschool, kindergarten, you talk about consent and body um, body space and things like that. And then you move on to talking about, you know, relationships and like good touch, bad touch. And then you move on to then talking more about, um, about sex and about contraception, about STI. So there is a progression that's age appropriate, highlighting the principles and advice that we want to give to children and youth, not so much about the one thing itself. So with substance use, this is similar, um, talking about, um, in, uh, early childhood about emotion regulation. What do you do to um, manage your emotions or what do you do to manage your anxiety or uh, when you seek a, a stimulation or excitement, or, you know, what is, how, how can it be, what is safe, what is unsafe and to have that conversation. And then going on as you get older, talking about um, what's in the news, for example, you know, there will be news articles and news stories about 
overdose deaths and, and as parents and caregivers talking about that and the schools talking about that. Um, and then as you get older, it, especially around that grade six, grade seven time uh, is, a, is a very prime time to intervene because that will be, you want to intervene before substances enter their lives and you want to intervene as substances enter their lives and you want to have resources available for when substances are going to be problematic. So there are um, different, uh, there's a pilot program that we're doing here in BC targeting that, uh, I think grade six, seven, maybe eight um, age range uh, doing uh, preventative, but also targeted intervention uh, education in schools. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. We're now at 12.35, so we're at time, but this has been extremely helpful, um, very informative, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks again.